Okay, let's see. Hi, this is Elliot Fishman, and uh, hopefully I'm live with you on uh, Facebook. Facebook has um, started this new thing, and uh, so the screen is a little bit different, and a whole bunch of different things. I'm looking at the video speed and audio speeds and event logs and everything else. So a lot of information, but uh, I um, hopefully will uh, not really worry about that. I can see... Uh, People are, uh, are are logging in. So um, good. All right. Let's um, let, let me get started. And uh, so first of all, let me just so you can see I'm home today. That's my uh, background. That's my uh, part of my toys. Uh, but um, I just wanted to just check in. First of all, that everyone's doing well, and uh, hopefully we're uh, kind of fighting the battle. Uh, numbers although not encouraging or looking better i guess it's not going to be encouraging until it's over but um hopefully uh, i think in maryland and some other areas nearby the peak is supposed to be around the 15th of april which is good because it was supposed to be in may so hopefully we get through the peak and everything will be good i know in maryland the numbers are somewhat stable so that's a good thing and i think everyone is kind of hunkered down there's not a lot of road traffic or foot traffic. And I think because people are a little bit spread out and people are using some common sense, things are working. So I, I thought that uh, I would not be speaking about COVID-19 today. I will say that um, we posted an article that was just made from uh, in radiology. Uh, Jeff Rubin the first author. It was a multi, uh, multiple people in different specialties from around the world talking about some recommendations of how to use uh, imaging with COVID-19, the advantages and the disadvantages. And so um, I just um, um, wanted, I think it's a good thing to look at if, if you want to look at that. So that that's a good article. And today I was going to speak about the spleen because I thought perhaps we, we need to make certain that we are learning uh, a bunch of new things. We are doing, um, and I am thinking about trying to have some guest speakers besides myself talking about topics outside of radiology, which I think is a welcome break for many of you. So hopefully I'm working on that. I have to figure out a good way of doing it uh, where I can interview someone remotely. I don't want to be the Jimmy Fallon show or something like that, but something where we have a, a low level technology and yet make things work very well for you guys as well. Now, I do know that I, I, I was trying to figure out how I could see who's online, but for some reason I can't do that. So I'll apologize if I don't get to anybody's questions because I can't figure out where uh, where people are actually. So I, I really don't see that. I don't want to press any of the buttons on this new version. Uh, so talking about the spleen, I think one of the interesting things about the spleen, and we have a number of lectures, as a, a new set of lectures that will be coming up soon on uh, CTSS as well. But one of the things that we um, have spoken about is that it's very important to recognize, and let me just sit up straight here, that most splenic lesions are in fact benign and are incidental findings. Now, obviously we know you're gonna have splenic involvement in lymphoma, metastatic disease like melanoma, but we can have abscesses, we can have infarcts, that's not malignant, but those are high level pathology. But at the end of the day, most splenic lesions are in fact gonna be benign. And so like the adrenal gland where the majority of lesions are adenomas, in the spleen, it's hemangiomas and hematomas and cysts, things that really don't need any further workup. The spleen is not something you want to biopsy uh, if you can help it. And it's interesting that in the liver, the kidney, the bowel, we've developed multiple different techniques over the years, but the spleen really hasn't had a whole lot of change. You could do arterial phase, but often the arterial phase relates to things like splenic artery aneurysms. Venous phase may be more helpful, though I have found that um, the arterial phase and venous phase together, particularly when you're evaluating some suspected splenic pathology, works very nicely. Most of the time, of course, you're sort of in the venous phase, and those are going to be the incidental findings you do have. Now, I'm looking, there's an article that was written I thought very well well said uh, in 2008 by Stewart, and I'll read it to you, or Sievert, and I'll read it to you, which says, 
In conclusion, in patients with an incidental splenic mass identified at imaging with the absence of a history of malignancy, fever, weight loss, or pain in the left upper quadrant or epigastrum, such masses are highly likely to be benign regardless of their appearance. Additional imaging or follow-up is not warranted even if the mass does not show the appearance of a simple cyst. So they were saying is that really the clinical decision-making is really what drives the imaging proponent. So if you tell me a patient has a splenic lesion and it's irregular and low density and maybe it's solitary or multiple and the patient's febrile, then I got to be worrying about an abscess. If a patient has wedge-shaped lesions and maybe they have endocarditis, then I got to be thinking about an infarct. And any patient who's post-op of course, I'm also going to be thinking about an infarct because that's something that uh, we do see not uncommonly. We could talk about infarcts. Most of the ones we see are small and wedge-shaped, though we can have global infarction, though that's more common in patients with trauma. It's more common in patients who've had surgery, so you have uh, some sort of procedure uh, that, and this uh, interruption of flow to one of the splenic vessels, and you can get global infarction. So we talk about global versus focal, but I don't think that's all that difficult. You really can recognize it. Uh, infarction can present with left upper quadrant pain. We talk about other lesions. Uh, obviously, uh, it, on the infectious side, abscess, infarct are things I think about. I also put in that category, though it's not perfect, are pseudocysts or splenic pseudocysts. And what I mean by that is we talk about splenic cysts, epidermoid cysts, epithelial cysts, but you can see cysts with infection, hydatid, but then again, you'll have multiple hydatid cysts in the liver as well. But patients who've had pancreatitis, particularly repeated episodes of pancreatitis, remember where the splenic artery and vein enter the spleen, fluid contract, a pseudocyst contract because that's the barrier of the spleen and contract beneath the splenic capsule and create a mass effect, almost the equivalent of a page kidney. That those patients are more prone to spontaneous splenic bleeds and spontaneous splenic ruptures. So, but again, it's not the typical patient who has one episode of pancreatitis. It's the patients who have had episodes of pancreatitis numerous times, and you typically will see calcifications as well, the so-called chronic pancreatitis, as well as acute pancreatitis. Now, if we go beyond that and we say malignancies, Primary splenic malignancies, angiosarcoma is very rare. We used to talk about that with vinyl chloride, with thoratrest. We do see it occasionally, a very vascular mass infiltrating and irregular. It's an exceedingly rare tumor. More common tumors are things like lymphoma. That's probably more common. And then metastasis. And as patients live longer with many diseases, particularly, let's say, melanoma, splenic meds are not going to be uncommon. Splenic meds can be solitary, though lymphoma is more likely solitary, but lymphoma as well as meds can be multiple. I also should bring in, at least mention, that one of the things we see with multiple splenic lesions, often as an incidental finding, again, not simple cysts, but hypodense lesions, is going to be sarcoidosis. Remember, up to 70% of patients with sarcoid have splenic involvement, although in most cases, splenic and liver involvement is very high percentages, but the patients are asymptomatic and it's incidental findings. And I think I've shown you cases over the years on CTSS, which show splenic lesions and hepatic lesions, and it looks like malignancy, metastasis versus a primary lymphoma. And yet the patients are asymptomatic, a CT was done for mild trauma or some vague reason, and everyone's worried about malignancy and it ends up being sarcoidosis. Sarcoidosis, we know, is a great mimicker of many things but it's particularly a great mimicker of things that are in the spleen and in the liver. So if you see a lot of splenic lesions, consider that possibility. Often the case is that they don't know the patient does have sarcoid. You can look at the chest or get a chest CT or chest X-ray, and you'll see the classic findings of sarcoidosis. So that indeed can be very helpful. We talk about splenic hemangiomas. That's typically rated the most common splenic lesion, but Hemangiomas in the liver, we talk about peripheral puddling and central filling in. And we talk about the fact that hepatic hemangiomas are typical in about 90% of cases. Splenic hemangiomas occasionally have that peripheral to central filling in, but to be quite frank, that's uncommon. Sometimes they have peripheral enhancement, sometimes they're numerous. Clipple Trinani Weber has too many to count splenic hemangiomas. But sometimes I see splenic hemangiomas 
multiple as an incidental finding, so it can be tricky. Again, often there's some peripheral enhancement, but you don't see the filling in. And sometimes you just see multiple lesions and occasionally off calcification. So again, you could think about that as well. Now, splenic hematoma is something, I showed a case I had conferenced yesterday I was giving to the faculty, and I showed a mass in the liver that was very, mass in the spleen rather, that was very vascular, that it did wash out, but it had a bulge, a very smooth bulge around it. And I think hamartomas, and there's been articles about that, and we've spoken about that, hamartomas can really create a very nice bulge around the lesion. They're usually well-defined, variable vascularity, hamartomas of benign lesions. I've seen a number of cases where people have been operated on for hamartomas because the PET is indeterminate, the MR is indeterminate, the CT is indeterminate, and no one has really seen them. And the patient's asymptomatic, and it's usually told to the patient, listen, we can't rule out lymphoma, we can't rule out some other malignancy, maybe we should just take it out to be, to be careful. And I understand where that comes from, but I think I can almost always recognize hamartomas. When you have splenic involvement by malignancies, whatever the type, primary or metastatic, there's an infiltration, there's the capsule, the surfaces are irregular. When you look at hamartomas and look at CTSS, we just posted some, it's that outpouching, that border that's very, very classic. So I typically feel that we have no issue. There are some unusual splenic lesions, literal cell tumors or sand tumors. Uh, the littoral can be difficult to differentiate, at least in theory, from the hamartomas because they are somewhat vascular, um, but they're rare. They're rare. So if, I think if you see a lesion that's not bulging and it's somewhat vascular, literal cell tumors are something you need to think about. And again, I think we've posted some references to that on the website, so that can indeed be helpful to you. Um, in terms of splenic abscesses, you know, the quote I made from that article, the patients have left up a quadrant pain, but no fever. Abscesses typically have fever. Uh, patients with endocarditis, both abscess and infarcts. Infarcts can go and become abscesses. We talk about other things um, with abscesses, patients post-op, patients with foreign travel. We talk about E. coli being the most common, but again, it ranges from hydatid data disease to actinomycosis. We've seen some unusual organs involving the spleen. We've seen diverticulitis causing seeding of splenic and hepatic abscesses. You can have hepatic and splenic abscesses, particularly in patients who are immunosuppressed. So again, in the immunosuppressed patient, bone marrow transplant, we talk about abscesses like candidiasis or aspergillosis but those are multiple tiny lesions. And typically you've had a scan that's negative. Now you see multiple small lesions that almost look like cysts. Patients who have uh, candidiasis, most commonly they'll also have other organ involvement, either liver or kidney or both liver or kidney. So it's unusual to have uh, some fungal infection within the spleen uh, and not have other organ involvement. You can, but again, the history of immunosuppressed patient, multiple small lesions are typically going to be very helpful to you. So I think with the spleen, the history is, like with everything, history is very, very helpful. Now, someone has a comment here about the, if we've seen COVID with splenic involvement. The answer is no, I've not seen COVID with splenic involvement. Most of the COVID patients I've seen, I've seen a couple with acute cholecystitis, but I think it's just acute cholecystitis, and the patient also had uh, infiltrates. It's hard to put the two of them together. There's been some articles in the literature talking about acute abdomen presenting. Uh, initial presentation is COVID-19, but it's hard to, it's kind of a chicken and egg thing that some of those patients uh, have been nursing home patients, and so they're doing poorly, they have a complication, and then all of a sudden they're in the hospital, but they also have community acquired infection. So that that can be a, a challenge as well. Now, um, I do wish I saw the questions. I can tell there are a bunch of questions from people, but I, I really can't um, can't see them. Um, what else what else could we mention? Now, what if you don't know and you're really perplexed and this referring doc wants you to do something? Occasionally MR would be helpful, particularly if it's malignancy MR, it would be uh, hot would, would show a, a different uh, um, uptake pattern. PET-CT has been used. If you're thinking infection, obviously PET is pretty good in that regard. 
A pet typically is negative for hamartomas, hemangiomas, and the like. So perhaps a pet could be helpful in select situations. People often, when they have also done uh, biopsies, and biopsies can be done carefully with experience. So that's something that is a possibility to do. So again, uh, you might want to think about that as a possibility. But again, the majority of cases, really nothing needs to be done. So you want to be really careful and conservative. I think also in this uh, COVID-19 era, you also want to be especially careful chasing incidental omas. You want to be very, very conservative. Some things, obviously, they're incidental, but they're critical. It could be malignancy. But you know, I would tend to be erring on the conservative side and recommending short-term follow-up if you're really uncertain. And that's true on many incidental omas because you just don't have the usual contact between physicians and patients and everything else. So it can be kind of challenging in that regard. Um, I would say any questions and I'd love to answer them. So if people have questions, I think the thing to do is I'm looking at my thing here, trying to figure out where the heck the questions are, but I can't figure out where that is. So again, I'm not going to try. I know I see two things. Adrian Cook from Sparks, Nevada, and Kay Kathy loves my souvenir wall. Yeah, you can see back there, I got um, Nemo, and I got a bunch of stuffed animals, and then I have I have an iPod, iPad, iPod, one of original iPods back there. I have Donald Trump when he was on The Apprentice. I have a whole bunch of other cool stuff, uh, which you, you can see. Um, so it's, uh, I think all of us have... Uh, there was a thing on TV I showed the other day about being careful what background you have. Here it looks like I'm a humble person with a bunch of toys. But uh, I think some people worry about, uh, um, just worry about, you know, showing a big fancy house. Like, uh, I don't have a big fancy house. I don't have to worry about showing that. So uh, uh, no problem at all. So if you have any questions, you think about things. I think we do have a new lecture on the spleen coming up soon. I think Hannah's working on editing a bunch of the stuff. Again, our, we've not changed anything every Monday. We're putting up a new lecture. Uh, we're now at over 270,000 cases. I've been adding cases every day and labeling them. Lily's adding them, I'm labeling them. So there's a lot of really good stuff there. We're expanding the AI section on a daily basis. Essentially, uh, we're showing a lot of the COVID stuff to make it easy for you. Look under the pearls. A lot of stuff is coming, so we are constantly uh, we're trying not let, to let the virus slow us down. So we're doing a lot of cool stuff, and I hope you enjoy it. And with that, I'll stop there. I'll thank everybody for their attention, and uh, we'll see you next time. Have a great day, and be careful.